Hey guys, here we are ready for chapter 21.3. We're going to talk about reducing solid waste. Now, we're just going to talk about the benefits of the four R's and pretty quickly, with, I mean, in short, that's really what we're going to do today is walk through how we can do the four R's, refusing, reducing, reusing, and recycling. In brief, these things decrease the consumption of matter. You know, we're not using as much and it saves energy resources. It would reduce pollution and also our natural capital degradation, you know, not taking down as much forest or using as much water, what have you. And it actually saves money. So once again, in short, that's just kind of what we're after, if you will. Unfortunately, today's industrialized societies have largely substituted reusable items for throwaway items. You know, we kind of traded putting stuff in a glass bottle like milk that we recycled and got refilled to the plastic milk jug that we throw away. That's what we mean by substituting reusable with throwaway. So some of the questions we have to ask ourselves in order to reduce consumption. Do I really need it? How many of these do I really need? You know, am I just buying them because? Is this something I can use more than once? And this is a big thing, reusing it over and over and over. And then, can I repurpose this product when I am done with it? This is the four R's, right? Refuse. Do I really need it? If not, refuse it. How many of these do I really need? Uh, you know, reducing. Is this something I can use more than once? reusing and then, you know, recycling. What do I do with it when I am done? So what are some of the things you can do as an alternative to this throwaway society? Now, you know, we talk about the four R's, we're going on and on about it. Rent things, rent, borrow, barter goods. Like if you're done with it, you might be done, but it still might be good. You know, resell it or barter. Hey, I'll give you this for that. You know, have a community of people that you trade things around with. And especially as you guys start having young families and babies, trade baby clothes and toys around because they go through them really quick, but a lot of times they're still really good. You know, they don't need to be thrown away. Any of this is the idea. You know, rent, borrow, barter. Uh, use them again and again. Buy things that are reusable, and especially shopping bags. Go to Publix or wherever with a shopping bag. Don't use the little plastic bags all the time. Have something you can reuse over and over and over again. Buy things that have been recyclable or are recyclable or are compostable, and then you know use your four R's with them. Buy things with very little packaging. If it's at all possible, you have a choice between here and here. You know, sometimes when I'm ordering something, I have a chat that I can click a box of minimal packaging. It's not on everything, but if I can, I do. Buy in bulk. A lot of times you would go to buy things, we'll get the bat, you know, we'll take our container and get our couscous instead of buying a container with couscous. You know, we already have one that we use at home. Anyway, you know, trying to reduce. And avoid disposables as much as possible. Avoid the paper, plastic bags, plates, cups, utensils, anything that you can. I mean, I realize there's always times that we need those, and that's one thing, but we don't want to get in the habit of using them all the time, which unfortunately, in a lot of our industrial societies, we kind of have done. Even when it comes to preparing your food, cook with whole fresh foods instead of the heavily packaged don't buy the packaged lasagna, make the lasagna. Buy the fresh vegetables instead of in a can. No can, right, if I get the vegetables. And if I do get a can, at least recycle it. But try and get things in bulk. Buy the fresh vegetables, fresh meats, instead of buying it in something that's already prepackaged. Discontinue junk mail. Oh my goodness, if I could magically click a box and no junk mail came in my mail, that would be fantastic, but there are some things you can do at the post office to discontinue. And if you're getting some, you can have them discontinued and try to do that as much as possible just to minimize the, you know, I don't want all these advertisements. So trying to minimize them if at all possible. Now let's go into these. We're gonna talk about reusing at this point, just some specific reuse. Now the European Union, 
They have banned e-waste from landfills and incinerators. It is illegal to throw away your laptop, your cell phone, your television, these electronics into landfills or for them to be incinerated. Manufacturers are required to take back products at the end of their useful lives. You know, I'm kind of done with it. Even if, even if it's working, but it's old, and I want to get rid of it, the manufacturer where you bought it from is required to take it back in the European Union. We need to take this approach. Everybody needs to take this approach. Japan and China have a take back approach to their products. Bring it back, and then the manufacturers can sort it, recycle it, reuse, and it keeps these hazardous materials, you know, valuable materials and hazardous materials out of our hazardous, or not even hazardous, out of our landfills, our waste. Finland banned all beverage containers that cannot be reused. You cannot get a plastic beverage container. It's got to be glass or aluminum, something that can be reused over and over and over. Use rechargeable batteries whenever possible. Instead of buying the whole pack of double A's, buy rechargeables. You know, you use it when you're done, you throw it back in the rechargeable, and we can use that same battery over and over and over. You can get several years of use out of a rechargeable, as opposed to if one was going to call it regular, you know, our nickel metal halide batteries. And once again, please, please, please use re usable cloth bags for groceries. Those bags need to have a tax on them. If we had to pay 25 cents per bag, like when I get the public say, would you like plastic bags? There's a 25 cent charge per bag. People would stop using them. They'd say 25 cents a bag. Boy, you're gonna put 10 bag, you know, 250. No, I'll buy one $2 reusable bag and use it over and over. We just need to start charging for them. They should not be free because they cost too much on the back end. Uh, but once again, that's just one of the things. We could ban them, but instead of banning them, just charge for them. Uh, it's the easiest thing to do. Many cities have actually already banned the plastic bags here in Gainesville. They tried a while back, but then there were some lawsuits, et cetera. Hey, you don't have to ban them, start charging for them. You start charging 25, 50, a dollar a bag, people will stop using them. Anyway, just my thoughts. But banning those polystyrofin food containers, et cetera, here in Gainesville, we ban the plastic straws. We can only use paper. These are steps in the right direction. Also, use shared use things, just like the library, right? We share the books. You go to the library, you can check out a book. I've got videos in my car. I gotta go take back to the library today. Libraries are great. Well, we can have libraries for tools, right? There's a lot of tools out there I don't need in my garage. I only need them a few times a year. Well, if there was some place I could just go and I could check it out, oh, I wouldn't buy my own. I would happily go check it out. We need to have some tool libraries, toy libraries, and especially for kids. Little kids, they go through toys, you know, because they're kind of age appropriate, right? And then you're kind of done with them, and we tend to pitch them. They could go back to the toy library and other people can share them. Once again, you know, we need to have some of these things in place and you guys are going to be the ones to help do some of that and really get it started. When it comes to the reusing, you know, buy beverages and refillable glass containers and metal containers are better. Reusable lunch containers, don't use a plastic bag every day or a paper bag every day. Something you can take it in over and over and over again. A reusable coffee container. Right, uh, you can show up at Starbucks with your, and they will put the coffee in your container. You don't have to take the paper ones all the time. You reusable containers in the fridge, rechargeable batteries, you know, it goes on and on. We can come up with lots of ideas and ways to reuse, and we've got to start doing it. Now, let's talk recycling. Recycling. There is primary closed loop recycling, and this is what we mean, the material goes into the same type. So I throw an aluminum can away and it gets turned back into another aluminum can. This is primary closed loop recycling. And a lot is this, you know, glass goes in that was a bottle, they turn it back into a bottle. Because they know it was already of that level, quality, if you will. Then we have secondary recycling. 
Secondary recycling is when the materials get converted into other products. This is where my aluminum can becomes aluminum foil, right? Or my aluminum can becomes an airplane part, uh, secondary, converted into something else. Now, wastes that can be recycled, we kind of have pre-consumer and post-consumer. Pre-consumer, this is what's happening at the manufacturing plant. You know, when they're making the tin cans, there's little bits of scrap, right, that don't get used or cut off, and those can be taken and melted back down and used again. So this is pre-consumer. Internal waste at the plant, right, the manufacturing process can recycle. And then there's post-consumer. I have the aluminum can and I'm done with it, and that's waste generated by us. So these kind of two types that we can talk about, you know, pre and post, if you will. When it comes to recycling, we have upcycling. That's where we're recycling it into something more useful than the original item. So an aluminum can gets turned into a car part, you know, upcycling. We have downcycling. The aluminum can gets turned into something less useful. This would be probably like aluminum foil, if you will. Now we can talk about other things. I could take about a plastic bag. My little reusable plastic bag gets recycled and turned into some lawn furniture, you know, upcycled, taking something that wasn't as useful, something that's going to be longer lasting and be on my yard for years and years and years to come. In order to do the recycling, they're just necessary steps, right? We have to collect materials. Then we have to convert these materials into new products, and then you and I have to buy these products. If they make things out of recycled material, but nobody buys them because they don't want them, they're not going to make them. So if we're going to support recycling, we also have to look for and purchase items that have been recycled because when they label made from recycled have that as a preference we want to support those industries if we're really going to buy into this idea also with incentives the united states could recycle and compost up to about 80 percent of our municipal solid waste we're not doing that much right now but the projected things are we could, but it would take some incentives. We got to get more people on board. Millions of tons of precious metals are actually lost as e-waste, whether it's gold or platinum, copper, there's lots of silver, aluminum are in our e-waste, and we've got to recycle those. Make sure you take all of your electronics to a recyclable area. A, once again, a lot of times the stores like Best Buy or Circuit City or whatever it is maybe near you will take those back so they can get recycled. And we want to compost everything we can, yard waste, food, etc. This is nature's recycling of nutrients, if you will. Now, composting can be small scale, kind of like the picture back here where it's just in your yard. You got a bin and you can throw your yard waste in it, compost it, turns it into nice fertilizer that you can spread in your garden or wherever else it might be needed. Composting can also be even really small scale. Like I talked about my kind of worm bucket where all of my kitchen waste goes into it and it's a small thing. The worms come in and eat it and they go back out and aerate and fertilize my garden. Or it can be really big scale out here. You know, large manufacturing of composting where they're putting it out, allowing it to compost, and then they'll scoop it back up and use it as fertilizer somewhere else. But composting can take all sorts of forms. You and me at home, uh, at a city scale, an industrial scale, lots of options for it. And when we talk recycling, we really can't talk recycling without mentioning paper. 55% of the world's industrial tree harvest, you know, cutting down trees to make something, is used to make paper. 55% of all trees that are harvested are making paper. Now, we can make paper from completely tree-free. We can use things like straw or canaf, uh, hemp. There are lots of things that grow very quickly and seasonally that don't take years and years to grow that we can make paper from. But a lot of our industry is already set up to utilize the trees and switching to using straw and carnap or others we just haven't done yet. 
but it can be done and we really need to shift to it as much as possible. This pulp and paper industry, if you will, you know, the whole process of making boxes, paper, what have you, is the fifth largest consumer of energy on the planet. There's just an awful lot of energy going into making the paper. It uses a lot of water and it creates pollution. Anytime we recycle, it is much less harmful because we already have the product. We're not having to convert it from the tree. It's an easier process and it doesn't use as much energy. Now, recycled paper, just talking about this, compared with paper from wood pulp. So I cut down a tree and turn it into paper, or I use recycled. When we recycle it, it is 30% less water pollution in it, and it generates 74% less air pollution. This is just a reality. The process of uh, liquefying wood, if you will, does wind up creating a fair amount of air pollution. Once again, recycling is always a better option when we have it available to us. Let's talk glass, recycling glass. Whether it's a bottle of some kind, a container that you maybe buy your spaghetti sauce in, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Glass. Now, in the United States, about 33% of our glass is recycled. It's pretty good, but 67% is just making its way into landfills. This is one of the first materials to really be recycled on a large scale. But unfortunately, for some countries, it is more costly to recycle it than to just dump in the landfill. If you have large areas of land available, it's cheaper to just toss it than it is to, you know, collect it, process it, and all the work that goes into it. Also, it's expensive to separate broken glass from the garbage. You know, if it's not put in its own bin, trying to break it, you know, it's expensive to do that. And the amount of non-recyclable trash in recycle bins is increasing. It's very important that you don't put trash in with a recycling bin. Make sure it is recyclable. Don't just toss something in because, well, I think it is. Know that it is. Because when we put things in there that aren't recyclable, it takes a lot more energy and a lot more expense. And a lot of areas are stopping the recycling because the amount of trash that's in the recycle and it becomes too expensive to try and hand pick out the trash from the recyclable. So. Our solution is to reuse the glass containers as much as possible. We do want to recycle it, but reuse it many times before finally pitching it in the trash, if at all possible. I realize we can't reuse some containers over and over and over, but many of them we can. Plastics, recycling plastics. Now, plastics in general, this is a petroleum byproduct, right? It's composed of resins that really come from oil and natural gas. When we're processing the oil, the natural gas, we are producing, making the plastics. Currently, only about 9.5% by weight is recycled. Very small amount. Part of this is there's a lot of different types of plastic resins, and they're different to separate. Uh, this is just reality. Not all plastic is created equal, right? Some are more recyclable than others and some don't really mix well. We can't just melt all of it down and have a plastic. They, the different qualities have to go out. When you look on the back, there'll be numbers on the recycling, one, three, five, etc. And these plastics have to be separated into separate bins before they can actually be recycled. And this is why so few of them really are. In 2014, we had the first recyclable thermoset plastic. So it's a plastic designed specifically to be able to be recycled easily. Uh, this may be something that helps out. We've kind of got to wean ourselves off of plastics as much as possible. Now recycling. Recycling in general has advantages and it has its disadvantages. The advantages, you know, net economy, our health, and then there are environmental benefits. You know, we can make money from it, it provides jobs, we don't have the pollutants out in the world, so it's better for our health, and not having the plastics and everything or as much in the landfills producing waste and pollution, etc. The disadvantages of it, it's costly, especially if it's a single pickup system. If everything just goes into one bin, this is the least beneficial that works. 
Sorting recyclable dye types is the best way. Now here in Gainesville, we have two bins, one for paper and then the other for the metals and plastics and glass. Honestly, we'd be better off with maybe a four bin, maybe one bin for paper and one that was built into three. Much better to really have plastics in one area, glass in one area, and metals in one area. The more sorting that's done by you and me, the better off it gets. But unfortunately, people say that if it's hard to do, they're not going to do it. So we have this trade-off. We're trying to make it as easy as possible, but we've also got to make it functional and work. Really having multiple bins works best. And honestly, it's not that big of a deal if I get, you know, my plastics go here. Because when I'm throwing things away, it's usually one at a time, right? I'm going out with my cans or I'm going, it's not that hard for me to toss it in this bin versus that bin. But more bins actually winds up being better in the long run. Because if it all goes into one bin, a lot of times, even though you think you're recycling, it's just going to an incinerator or it's going to a landfill because it's too expensive to sort it out so yeah although you know it reduces energy all the various benefits it can actually cost more than dumping it in a landfill if we're having to sort it too much now in the United States we really have a threat to our recycling by and large it goes in the bin and then the cities that collect it, they're really looking for somebody to buy the recyclables. So they have them collected and the city's like, we have aluminum, we have glass, we have plastic. But the city isn't in the business of making plastic bottles or plastic furniture or remelting down the glass. They have to sell it to somebody. And by and large, we sold our plastics and our e-waste to China. They were the largest purchase. They would take it and they would sort it. They had the manpower, if you will. Well, in 2018, China banned the import of mixed paper. You know, it was just all the paper in one bin. Uh, mixed plastics and e-waste were all banned. They said, we will not take it anymore. And by and large, we had nobody to buy this stuff. So all of a sudden, we've got all this recycled material but nobody wanted to buy it. In the U.S., nobody would buy it because they couldn't make money from it. It was too expensive. And we've been left sorting, trying to figure out what to do. The Chinese market was so large, it was very difficult to try and replace. You know, we tried to find other countries. We sell a little here and a little here and a little there instead of all of it in one place. But it's been incredibly difficult to find someone else to do it, to buy it and recyclables are piling up in areas and then sometimes they're just making their way to the incinerator or they're making way to a landfill because we don't have anything else to do with them. Once again, the city has to ultimately get rid of it. If there's no buyers, they just toss it. Now this could be a net overall benefit because if we have nowhere to go to it, we may have the incentive to start making things more reusable, making things more recyclable because now that we realize we don't have somewhere we can just dump it, we've got to start taking care of our own waste. And this may wind up being enough to educate us into doing what we really should have done all along. We were just pushing our problem off on someone else. Now we're going to have to take ownership for it and take care of it ourselves. Well, guys, that wraps it up for what we do with it. Come back for Chapter 21, Section 4. And we'll look at should we burn it or should we bury it?